Hi, everybody. I'm Katherine Riddell. I'm the Assistant Director at the Rye Free Reading Room. Welcome to our program tonight entitled Breakfast, Lunch, Dinner, Supper, American Meals in Historical Context. We are so fortunate to have um, Susan Wasper Johnson here. Again, we love having her here. She's also known as the food historian. Her um, uh, programs are always so much fun and so informative. I just wanna tell you a little bit about her before I hand it over to her. Um, Sarah is an author, speaker, educator, podcaster, blogger, and um, does these talks throughout libraries and other places, museums. Um, and she's also working on a book um, entitled Preserve or Perish Food in New York State during the Great War 1916 through 1919. Once again, so happy to have you and thank you all for being here and I'll turn it over to Sarah now. Thanks so much, Catherine. As per usual, I always love talking for the Rye Free Library. We have such fun. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, tonight's talk is a brand new one. So if you have any questions as we go, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. And there we go. Sorry, I just had to go ahead and get started. So again, tonight's topic is breakfast, lunch, dinner, supper. American Meals in Historical Context, um, I thought it'd be really fun to talk about how when and what we eat has changed over time in the United States. So that's going to be the topic of tonight's talk. We're going to start out talking about individual meals, and then we'll talk about um, the chronology of American history that kind of influences how and what we're eating. And we're going to start from the 17th century all the way to the present and talk about the future. So that's how we're gonna handle it tonight. So, oh, I always do this, I have to click. There we go. All right, so I thought we'd start with breakfast. First meal of the day, right? So the word breakfast comes from breaking your fast, right? Because you haven't been eating while you're sleeping all night. Um, but it's not necessarily what you're going to do when you first get up, right? So throughout human history, oftentimes you had to do quite a bit of labor before you could eat, both in terms of just your everyday work, but also labor in order to make the meal. So if you got up quite early, you might not be eating breakfast until a couple of hours later. Um, when we eat breakfast also changes a lot uh, over time. And it depends a lot on your socioeconomic status. Because particularly as we get into the 18th and 19th century, the wealthier you are, you don't have to actually work for a living, right? You're more likely to be out later at parties and socializing. Um, so breakfast for the wealthy was much later in the day than breakfast for the agrarian class or the working class who had to eat quite early. What we eat also changes extraordinarily over time. So I have this great 1950s Swift bacon advertisement here, right? Bacon being very stereotypical breakfast food in the United States. But for most of human history, what you ate for breakfast was leftovers from the night before, right? So before we have widespread use of refrigeration, um, food is very perishable and it has to be consumed fairly quickly. Uh, so a lot of what we traditionally think of as breakfast foods don't actually arrive until later into the 18th and 19th centuries. We also have American style versus continental style breakfast. If you've ever gone to a hotel and they offer continental style breakfast, um, that is literally uh, a style of breakfast that is served on the continent, right, in Europe, and Americans start to be introduced to that in the 19th century as they start to travel more widely. Uh, whether breakfast is sweet or savory depends on the time period in which you're eating it. It depends on your cultural background. Um, and whether you eat a hot or a cold breakfast also depends on your socioeconomic status, the time period, and personal taste, right? All that fun stuff. Dinner. Now you might say, Sarah, why are you going from breakfast straight to dinner? Isn't dinner the evening meal? 
Well, historically it was not. Dinner was originally the noon meal. It was the large, hot, complicated meal of the day, which is why we now call dinner our evening meal because that's usually our large, hot, complicated meal of the day, right? But in a lot of rural areas, sometimes you'll, you'll see people or hear people call the noon meal dinner and then the evening meal is supper. So that's, we have kind of a rural urban divide that I'll get into a little bit more in the chronology. Um, and also the time in which people eat dinner shifts. Uh, and again, we don't really have a standardized time of day for people to eat dinner really until the end of the 19th and into the 20th centuries. And again, there's still that rural urban divide. We also have a cultural shift about dinner um, that again is really influenced by your socioeconomic status and when it's fashionable to eat the evening meal. And then we have lunch, right? Lunch is our noon meal now, but it wasn't always. Uh, my great grandmother would ask people, oh, do you wanna come over and have a little lunch? It could be 10.30 in the morning, it could be three in the afternoon, it could be 11.30 at night. And basically what she meant was a small meal that was largely served cold, right? So for her, that meant sandwiches and cake and coffee. That was a little lunch. Um, we get lunch instead of dinner because of time constraints thanks to industrialization. So of course I have this classic photo from, I think it's from the 1930s, building a skyscraper and all these guys are sitting on this I-beam thousands of feet in the air eating their lunches out of paper, little paper boxes, right? Because they can't leave the job to eat and you have very limited time. And again, that's in response to industrialization. This is something that starts really in the 1820s that we start to have these time constraints on our lunches. But again, depending on your socioeconomic status. We get the rise of the sandwich, right? Which was around since the 18th century invented apocryphally by the Earl of Sandwich, right? But by the time we get into the late 19th century in particular and into the 20th century it becomes a super popular lunch food. And we also get the rise of the lunch box. So these guys have little cardboard boxes, um, but you get the iconic big steel lunch box with the thermos and the top. You get kids popular lunch boxes in, as we go into the 50s and 60s. Um, and it becomes a way to carry lunch from home with us. The earlier antecedent is the lunch pail. And then finally we have supper. Um, a lot of people use dinner and supper interchangeably now to refer to the evening meal. Um, but historically it was the meal after dinner it could be held anywhere from, you know, four or five o'clock at night to nine or 10 o'clock at night, depending on what you were doing and depending on, um, again, your socioeconomic status, what your work li life looks like. Um, and surprisingly, supper throughout the 19th century, particularly in rural areas, you often had either leftovers from dinner or much simpler foods. You might have like hot cereal, you might have pancakes, you might have egg dishes, right? You know, something on toast, all these things that today we think of as more breakfast foods in the past were typically more supper foods. Um, the wealthy play a big role in suppers being the evening uh, meal and taking some, some changes and some liberties with that. Again, as we get on through the 19th century, as you'll see, we start to shift that evening meal. Um, late, the big meal of the day shifts later and later. And among the wealthy and particularly uh, large city, um, in large cities, you had people who would go to theater, who would go to opera, who would go to concerts. And so it became a fashion after those were done, which is usually about 10 o'clock at night, you would go back to somebody's house and have a midnight supper, right? Which is popular from really the 1890s to I would say like the 1940s, 50s as the reign of the midnight supper. And again, it's like simple sort of snacky things. Um, that's just fun to have people over. <laughs>
All right, so that's our little summary of the different types of meals that are usually eaten throughout American history. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the chronology of these meals and how they've changed over time. And like I said, we're gonna start in the 17th century, right? The United States, long before it was when I, the United States was a series of European colonies, um, many of which got established in the 17th century, the 1600s here in New York, right? That's in the 16 teens is when Dutch settlers first start coming over. Uh, most of the cooking was done on open hearths, right? Like this one, which means of course that it's extraordinarily labor intensive to create a hot meal. Right, so your breakfast would have been much later in the day or much later than you rise than is typical today. Um, the meal, the large meal of the day would have been the noon meal. Sometimes depending on your wealth status um, and the time of year, that might've been your only meal of the day. People did not necessarily eat three meals a day historically. Sometimes you only had two meals. Sometimes you only had one meal. Um, so that it's not really what we think of today typically as our progression of these three meals a day. It was much more fluid depending on the food that was available and the time constraints. Um, and I put corn as king because particularly in very early colonial America, a lot of the traditional European foods that people had come to rely on, particularly wheat, were not well suited to the climate or we didn't really know how to grow them early on in most of the colonies. New York and Pennsylvania actually turned out to be quite well suited to wheat, um, but we don't know that until a little bit later. So people are consuming a lot of corn-based foods, uh, including cornmeal mush, um, which is basically like polenta, but it could be consumed at any, any time of day, but it was a pretty typical um, morning meal or an evening meal, a supper dish. Um, so again, if you had cornmeal mush for supper, then in, in the morning, you might, it'd be cold, right, and congealed. So you might slice it up and fry it and have it for breakfast that way. The main emphasis throughout much of the 17th century in what becomes the United States is on survival. And it's very focused on food production and food preservation. So pretty much everybody's lives <laughs> We're almost totally consumed with either producing, um, cooking, or preserving food because that was the main issue with people was survival. I just have a couple of images here. This is a Dutch painting from the 1500s, actually, so it's from the 16th century. But I thought it was a pretty good example of the types of foods um, that may have been common in different households throughout the new world. Obviously not everything like artichokes and asparagus, probably less common, but there's um, a meat pie up here on the shelf. There's lobster, which is very common in New England. Um, we have a plucked chicken. We have a rib. This might be like lamb or mutton. We have some game birds here, including songbirds. Um, there's a hare. And you notice that it's very meat Centric. Although we do have some vegetables, we don't have a lot of starchy vegetables in this picture. And that's probably because this is for a wealthier household and this woman here is the cook. And even though I know this is probably um, just a perspective um, proportionate thing, her arms are huge in this picture, which I kind of like because she's got this mortar and pestle, right? And she's pounding, I don't know what, it doesn't really say maybe some of these, these look like maybe these are cloves down here. So she's hand grinding spices with a mortar and pestle. And it kind of illustrates how labor intensive it was to create food for people to eat in the 17th century. And this pretty much continues, this style of cooking pretty much continues into the 18th century. It's not until the very late 18th century and into the 19th century that we start to get um, some labor saving aids right? Uh, but it's pretty much all human powered. Humans gathering wood, humans carrying water, humans tending to fire, humans lifting all these really heavy pots, humans grinding stuff up, butchering animals, cleaning vegetables, all of that stuff was done pretty much purely by human labor. And then I like to have this other image. This is obviously a very romanticized 19th century 
um, painting of the first Thanksgiving, right? But I like it because um, it has a couple of things that illustrate 16th century eating habits. So you'll notice that almost everybody seated at the table is male and all of the children are standing, which was very common in the time period. Children did not necessarily get their own plates. <laughs> like your parents would feed you from their plate um, until you were old enough to be considered an adult. Uh, so I find that very interesting. This is also a little misleading because they're pretty much all, there's like actual pewter plates and glassware and stuff um, on the table, which may have been there for some wealthy people, uh, but a lot of people were probably eating on wooden plates. Um, and then also another thing from the 17th century is everybody would have their own eating utensils, a spoon and a knife that you would carry on you at all times. You might also share cups, right? And forks didn't exist. We didn't have forks in the 17th century. <laughs> Not until we get into the 18th century that we start to have forks. So I just thought this was a good illustration of kind of the style of dining that would have been happening in the 17th century. All right, getting into the 18th century. So for a lot of reasons in the 18th century, we have growing wealth in the United States. Um, the two main reasons are uh, taking land from indigenous people, right? So there's all sorts of natural resources free for the taking um, and also enslaving people from Africa. Those are the two lar single largest contributors to growing wealth in the United States. And with growing wealth and abundance of natural resources comes a lot of meat eating. A lot, a lot of meat eating. I have this nice um, illustration. It's actually from um, Mrs. Beaton, so it's British. But it's a series of cold collation dishes, which is like fancy cold buffet for parties. And it's pretty much all meat. There's cutlets and peas up at the top, um, stuffed larks in cases, which is on the top left, prawn, prawns en bouquet, right? So prawn, a bouquet of prawns with toast points, it looks like. Um, the center is a raised game pie, which pies do transition over to the United States, early colonial America. Um, but they start to change as we get into the 19th century to be less the freestanding meat pies that we're used to in British cuisine to more of the um, shorter pie plate fruit pies of the 19th century. But in the 18th century, we still had game pie. Um, there's a pigeon pie. There's a lamb cutlet down there in the lower left. Um, chicken creams, which looks like a gelatin based um, food and then plovers eggs on the bottom. So aside from the peas and some garnish, there are no vegetables. <laughs> In this whole stack of dishes, it's all meat. Um, and a lot of early European travelers actually comment a lot on the abundance of meat on American tables at all hours of the day. We also have chocolate for breakfast. Not as we would typically think of, and um, I'm going to have an image in the next picture that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more, but uh, chocolate was drunk until the mid 19th century. It was all drinking chocolate, not really hot cocoa like we think of today. The cocoa process was not really invented um, until the 1840s, 1850s. So everybody is pretty much just drinking grated up dark bitter chocolate <laughs> mixed with sugar and cream and water and kind of like they drank coffee and tea at breakfast you would also have chocolate. Uh, we do also get the development of a lot of regional foodways in the 18th century as we start to get more and more immigrant groups coming and also people are adapting to the different climates um, and that influences what you have for breakfast. So for example if you are Pennsylvania Dutch um, which is German, or if you are actually Dutch in New York, you might have your waffles with creamed chicken on top instead of maple syrup. Like we think of waffles today as a breakfast food instead it may be a supper food 
right? With creamed leftover chicken or, you know, your, your breakfast cereals, which would have been hot cooked cereals, right? Might be cornmeal mush, or it might be like rice, or it might be a buckwheat pudding or graham flour pudding, depending on where you live and what is available in your local agriculture. And then also Americans are starting to travel a lot more. So you get the development of inns and taverns and things where people can sort of start to eat communally, although most people do not eat in public unless they are traveling. Um, so you start to develop some regional foodways that way, but really it's not until the 19th century that that really gets underway. All right, and here's my chocolate illustration. This is an image from 1744, um, and it's a young woman who is breakfasting with chocolate. So that little gold pot there is probably supposed to be silver um, with her handleless China cups, right? Actually from uh, China, <laughs> she's, pour, she's got this little spigot and she's going to pour the thick melted chocolate mixed with hot water and sugar to make kind of like a syrup. And then she's going to add cream and maybe more sugar if she wants to. And that is her breakfast is she's just having chocolate, right? So obviously that kind of level of food was relegated to the wealthier classes. Um, the wealthier you were, the later you breakfasted and the more options you had for breakfast because of course someone else is cooking it for you. Um, and the more refined and labor intensive your breakfast options could be so instead of just having like porridge or a hash, you know, of leftovers from last night, you might have things like, you know, ham and smoked tongue and broiled tomatoes and pastries or toast, you know, eggs cooked to your liking, things like that, um, because you are not having to cook that yourself. <laughs> Someone else is doing it for you. So there's a much wider uh, availability. Same thing goes for the noon meal and for evening meals or parties, you know, there's this huge variety, a lot of meat, like I said, and also in the 18th century, um, particularly toward the end when we get more into the American Revolution, we start to get more French style of eating, which is basically all the, there were no courses, all the food was on the table all at once, um, including dessert and you kind of helped yourself. So that's a little bit of a change from what we typical, typically think of as historic um, dinners and suppers and things like that. All right, moving into early 19th century America, we have this great little very like, you know, American Dickensian style. It's like Christmas time. Um, they're having a big family dinner. This is probably from the 1830s or 40s, judging by the clothing here. You have liveried footmen, so it's quite a wealthy family. So in the first half of the 19th century, we start to get some tension, right, in our meals. There's the agrarian style of life, and then there's the increasingly urban and industrial style of life. So agrarian people, really kind of regardless of your socioeconomic status, kind of stuck to the same eating schedule as they had before, you know, breakfast after the morning chores are done, your big meal of the day was at noon, or if you're wealthy, maybe your big meal of the day was at like four or five. Um, and then you have the cities. We start to get the development of these big cities and um, industrial labor, right? And particularly with uh, fabric mills in New England, right, where we're having to starting to have factories, people are on a very tight schedule you start to have very limited time to have lunch. Um, so the girls who are working in like the Lowell mills and things like that, these mill girls lived in boarding houses and they would go home for their 30 minutes of dinner and the woman who ran the boarding house would already have it ready for you, right? Because she knew their schedule. She knew that 30 girls were gonna be just descending on her house to eat and then run back to the factory. But as that, moves on, we start to get away from kind of the more paternalistic um, factory management uh, to more exploitative factory management. And so people are kind of having to just grab lunch um, wherever they can, whatever they can bring, whatever they can buy. Um, the hot lunch starts to become a thing of the past, right? As I said, there's also this rural urban divide. Um, if you are wealthy and urban, 
you are more likely to socialize a lot more with your peers. You're more likely to stay out later. You're more likely to go to late night parties, which means you get up later and that kind of shifts your whole dining schedule. We also have the industrialization of food. So you're starting to purchase foods that you don't know who grew it or made it, which today seems like obviously, like, yeah, none of us know usually unless you know you're buying directly from the farmer where your food came from or who grew it but that was not particularly common for most of people's food consumption until we start to industrialize until we start to urbanize um, and with that comes the rise of some convenience foods um, but mostly it's just dangerous <laughs> because you have to deal with like food adulteration. Um, as cities grow bigger, um, food quality might be kind of precarious. Uh, and the poorer you are, the harder it is to afford fresh quality food. So that also influences how and when people are eating. And by the time we get to the 19th century, we have really figured out wheat farming. So bread is the staff of life for Americans in the early 19th century. Um, and meat is still, meat is still probably the primary thing that everybody wants, um, but bread is the more affordable thing. Uh, and white bread gets increasingly affordable and therefore increasingly desirable because previously only the very wealthy could afford white bread from refined white flour. Um, but as we mechanize flour production, that gets cheaper and cheaper and uh, more accessible as the century goes on. And then this is a, kind of a Marie Antoinette reference, but is also a reference to a couple of things, largely chemical leaveners, the development of chemical leaveners, um, and also some changes to our ovens, some changes to our tinware, and the increasing accessibility of refined white flour um, and refined white sugar, thanks to slavery. Uh, and then we do start to get a little bit of that dinner versus supper shift, particularly amongst the wealthy, moving away from having the big meal of the day being um, in the middle of the day. So just a couple of images. This is a very typical like 1830s kitchen, right? We're still open hearth cooking. There's um, a tin kitchen in the foreground of the hearth there. That gray thing is uh, a big half cylinder piece of tin with a spit on it that you could turn. But you see, we still have these heavy cast iron pots everywhere. There's one on the fire in the fireplace. And then there's two more cauldrons under the table there on the right. I should use my mouse right here. And then these women are both very involved in food preservation. It's probably the fall because we have um, some game birds on the wall. We have a suckling pig. We have a ham. She's butchering maybe what looks like Maybe it's a turkey, it looks kind of big. And then we have all of these vegetables uh, in the foreground. So she's rolling out a pie. These might be plums, not clear. But it's, they're pretty involved in food preservation and food preparation. And it's still a fairly labor intensive um, thing to do. So this is an early chemical leavener. It's an advertisement for something called Celeritus. Um, which basically you can see she's got this big giant puffed up thing. I can't tell if that's supposed to be like a cake or a popover or bread or what, but that really revolutionized baking for Americans. Um, quick breads become super common, biscuits, cornbread, um, a lot of fancier cakes that previously you would have to beat, uh, beat eggs you know, for 30 minutes at beet egg whites, or you'd have to use yeast to leaven your cakes. Now all of a sudden you can have chemical leaveners. So basically they're, um, they are basic in pH. And so you need to mix them with an acid, usually buttermilk or molasses, um, sometimes lemon juice or vinegar, but usually buttermilk or molasses. And that activates with the basic cause a chemical reaction and it bubbles up. Just like if you, you know, made your vinegar and baking soda Volcano baking soda comes a little bit later after things like pearl ash and celeritus. Um, and then eventually we get baking powder, which is where the basic and the acid are already combined. Um, and they just need a liquid to activate them, right? 
All right, post Civil War. The Civil War has a pretty big impact on a couple of our eating habits. Um, one of the main ones is the rise of railroads. And so I have this nice little image here. This is actually probably from the end or turn of the 20th century. Um, but railroads have an impact for a couple of reasons. One is that all of a sudden, foods that are very local to where they're grown can be shipped throughout the country. So things like oranges, things like seafood, things like fresh vegetables, all of a sudden become much more accessible thanks to railroads and in particular ice refrigerated railroad cars. Um, but also railroads allow people to travel. And when they're traveling on a railroad, sometimes it's for a really long time. And so the very early railroads in like the 18, 40s, 50s, 60s um, were not great. They're pretty filthy. They don't have good amenities. <laughs> but by the time we get to the end of the century, railroads are fairly luxurious and they have things like dining cars. Um, you have Fred Harvey on the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe with his Harvey girls, right? Not on the railroad themselves, but at each stop where the railroad has to take on fuel and water. Um, you could go in and eat a meal in his Harvey houses. So you start to get this exchange of how people are eating. And also people are eating more as they travel. So they're eating kind of while they're on the run, right? Which becomes a theme in American food history. Um, railroads are also super influential in what kind of meat we're eating and how accessible it is. So the 1870s, right, 1860s and 70s, all of our, um, I shouldn't say all, but a good chunk of our freed slaves, a good chunk of our former Confederate soldiers become cowboys. And they are tasked with moving Texas Longhorn cattle up to Kansas City, which then those cattle get placed on railroads and then sent to the Chicago Meatpacking District for distribution across the country. So previously, most cattle throughout American history was transported on the hoof. Um, and not very far from where it was raised. But with access to railroads, all of a sudden you can have huge um, meat packing plants, slaughterhouses. There's fresh beef that's, well, I should say fresh <laughs> beef that's much more widely available. You also start to get the rise of um, canned and dried and pickled beef. And so Americans become kind of a country of beef eaters, um, I think in large part because of the British preference for beef uh, kind of trickling down and across the pond with, with emigration. The other huge innovation in American meals and American cooking is the cook stove. So we talked a little bit about chemical leaveners being really influential in how people bake cakes. The cast iron cook stove is even more influential because instead of having a bake oven in the side of your your um, fireplace, right? Your open hearth that you have to fill with a fire and then rake out all of the coals and then hurry up and bake stuff according to how hot the temperature needed to be, right? So you start with your cookies and your cakes and you end with a pot of baked beans and you shut the door for overnight. Instead of that, all of a sudden you have an oven in a cast iron cook stove where the temperature is much more controlled. It's much easier to access um, and it's much easier to cook things quickly over a short period of time. You also get a, a real emphasis on breakfast cereals, not necessarily just the hot cooked cereals like oatmeal and cream of wheat and those sorts of things, although they are persisting um, and commercializing, but you get cold breakfast cereals with the likes of John Harvey Kellogg and then the guy who steals his uh, Willie Kellogg's recipe, um, TW Post. Sorry, the sun is setting, so we're getting some lens flare here. Uh, we also get the rise of brand name foods, right, and convenience foods, which really start to influence how people eat. Um, and then canned foods. So canned foods had been kind of around during the American Civil War, particularly um, sweetened condensed milk and canned peaches. Both have a big impact among Union soldiers because that's some of like the best food that was available to them besides hardtack and salted beef 
right? Which you're like, is it actually beef? Um, so those become really popular. So condensed milk, canned fruit, canned vegetables, commercially canned vegetables. Um, it's very difficult to home can low acid vegetables. I'm really sorry about the sun, you guys. I can't do anything about it. Um, it's really hard to can low acid vegetables at home. So buying it commercially made vegetables more accessible year round. And then we also get canned meat. A lot of those Chicago meat packers um, are starting to can beef. We get things like beef tea, right? Things that are really influencing how um, we are eating and even sometimes influencing what we're eating when. So I, I found this beautiful illustration of um, a mid 19th century kitchen. So gone is the open hearth. Uh, and instead we have this beautiful giant cast iron cook stove, which was still a lot to maintain and kind of dirty and hot and in some ways, not that much of an improvement on open hearth cooking, but the biggest improvement was, I think, elevating. <laughs> you don't have to bend over anymore to cook. And also um, you had much more control over the heat and temperature, right? So you could move things to different parts of the stove, depending on how hot the fire was. It was easy to stoke the fire up. You didn't have to wait for coals in order to cook on top of. Um, they were, um, they had better draft. And also they had ovens, which made making things like cakes and cookies so much easier. Uh, also pictured in this is a, a dry sink. This is her water supply, which I think is also being heated by the stove possibly. Uh, and then this is a, a dry sink. Um, so not necessarily draining, um, but we do have water access here. So this would not like drain into the sewer. You'd have to empty the water elsewhere. Uh, and then, but otherwise it's pretty, it's pretty sparse compared to today's kitchen. She's got a little pantry here with all of her, her um, cookware and stuff and dishes and things and a little table for preparing food. But other than that, it's just, it's just the stove. Interestingly, no ice box in this picture um, might be elsewhere. Or she might not have one. So this is another thing that starts to change in the late 19th century. Picnics had been kind of popular since the 18th century among the wealthy. And then obviously there are people who you're just eating out of doors because you don't have any place else to eat. <laughs> but leisure meals start to be more and more of a thing for a larger subset of classes in the latter half of the 19th century. This is, looks like it's about 1880s, 1870s, 1880s maybe. Um, so they're in a, a beautiful area. It's a, it's a um, advertisement for bottled olives right? But they're in what looks like a picnic grove. There's boaters in the background. They're having lobster and cake. And that looks like the guy has this bottle of olives that he's fishing olives out of. Um, but this is a, a little bit of a shift, uh, illustrates a shift toward the end of the 19th century that no longer are we focused so much on meals of survival. We're starting to get more toward meals of leisure and for pleasure uh, for a larger group of people. Then there's this stuff, right? So this is a very early, early advertisement for like basically the first cereal to come out of the Kellogg kitchens. It doesn't even say Kellogg, it's the Sanitarium Food Company in Battle Creek, Michigan, right? Because that's where Kellogg started as a health sanitarium. Um, and this is basically what launches the Kellogg and therefore CW Post um, cold breakfast cereal uh empires i guess and it was really a revolution because you know aside from maybe cold cornmeal mush which you're more likely to fry than anything um cold cereal was not really a thing people ate hot cereal with milk um so to be able to just dump some stuff out of a box and pour cold milk on it and ta-da you have breakfast was a real revolution in how people cooked and how they ate um, and particularly as you get more uh, white collar jobs, um, this becomes a very popular alternative to like the full hot breakfast that maybe we think about. This is another cute little advertisement. This is Campbell's boy, right? Talking about soup, Campbell's condensed soup, a little reference, I think, to there. I was really thinking. <laughs> 
Do we have a question? Nope. Okay. We're not muted. Please mute yourself. <laughs> um, so Campbell's Soup is interesting because they start out as a soup company, right? But pretty quickly they realize that people will only eat a fairly limited amount of soup. So they have to repurpose their soup product into something else that people will eat. And that kind of starts to um, change into the 20th century how people, what types of foods people are eating for their main meal of the day, right? We start to shift more toward like casserole style stuff, which was not really that popular in at the turn of the 20th century. All right. The turn of the 20th century, our main tension is the Gilded Age excesses of wealthy people eating, you know, like tons of meat, tons of game dishes, lots of wine, lots of sweet sugary desserts. And then the progressive era reformer asceticism, right, of that's gluttony. Uh, you should be eating only to nourish your body. If it shouldn't taste too good or you're going to overeat, right, you have to have self-control and willpower when it comes to food. This is the main tension that's happening at the turn of the 20th century. We also, this is the height of the temperance movement. So I have this nice little illustration here. Um, it says, sorry, I gotta move this. It says the temperance crusade, four hours in a bar room. So it's the first hour is cynical indifference. The second hour is mockery and defiance. The third hour is rage and despair. And the fourth hour is unconditional surrender. So this, this is a guy who is, has taken the temperance pledge, which you can see down here. Um, and it's hard to tell if he's deciding in favor of temperance after four hours or if he's breaking his temperance pledge after four hours in a bar. But again, this is tied to kind of like this Protestant thing against excess. Um, it starts really in the 1830s and 40s in reaction to the rise of distilled liquor in American society, which people consumed as if it was water in some cases, and it was really a destructive influence in a lot of people's lives. But um, temperance reformers went like totally the other way, you know, lips that touch liquor will never touch mine, that kind of thing. So this is one of our other tensions in changing how people eat. Um, no more wine with dinner right? No more cocktails at a party um, because of temperance. We also have a very Victorian obsession with dyspepsia that continues into the early 20th century. And a lot of that is because the type of food people are eating. So dyspepsia is Victorian terminology basically for indigestion or stomach complaints or bowel complaints, constipation. It's all kind of combined into this one word. Um, and people are eating a lot of meat, a lot of refined starches, a lot of sugar, a lot of alcohol, no whole grains, hardly any vegetables. The vegetables they didn't eat were cooked to death. Um, and people pretty much only ate vegetables for roughage, for fiber, so they would not get constipated. But a lot of people did decide they didn't want to eat vegetables. So dyspepsia was like this all-consuming interest for a lot of people. And the other thing is a lot of people were eating very questionable foods, particularly if you were middle to lower middle class or working class, um, particularly a lot of working class and poor people did not even have access to kitchens in their tenements or in their little garret apartments, right? So you were kind of forced to buy foods on the street um, from push cart operators and peddlers who are probably, if you did have a kitchen, you could cook in your house, but what's the quality of meat that you're getting? Has it gone off and it's being disguised as a pie? There's a real crusade against pie in the progressive era. Um, do I have that on here? No, uh, but it's supposed to be terrible for your digestion and you know hide questionable ingredients. Um, so that's one of the other things that's going on. We also get the rise of nutrition science. So people are starting to be concerned with, is the food we're eating actually nutritious? And what are the best foods to eat when? Um, and we get the rise of white collar jobs. So throughout the late 19th century, if you worked a white collar job, you would go home for lunch, 
for your lunch hour and your wife would have a hot meal waiting for you and you would eat at home. But a couple of things are happening with white collar jobs. One is that most white collar jobs are very sedentary. And if you're still eating a giant meal in the middle of the day um, and then going and sitting all afternoon, you're not gonna A, be a very efficient worker because you're gonna be tired and B, you're gonna get fat, which is what progressive era people were really concerned with. Um, in the Gilded Age, it was perfectly fine to be pleasingly plump, right? But by the time we get to the progressive era, progressive era, we have the Gibson girl and the athlete and everybody has to be tall and willowy and thin. Um, so there's some recommendations about changing eating habits based on what the, you know, we're trying to understand calories. So based on what your activity level is, they're starting to make recommendations about changing what you're eating when. The other thing is white collar jobs as we get into the 20th century, um, particularly the lower level white collar jobs, you don't have an hour or two hours to go home and have lunch. So you start to have to either go to a restaurant or a nearby club for your lunch, or you have to buy something from, you know, like a soda fountain or a push cart operator or something cheap. Um, and then we do have the rise of the development of soda fountains, which is really in direct response to temperance. So soda fountains start in a lot of pharmacies, right? Phosphates and things like that, soda water being a health, a health beverage. But by the time you get to the 20th century, it's like all ice cream and cake and ice cream sodas and things like that. So Americans pretty much replace the vice of alcohol with the vice of sugar, right? And that becomes a huge part of American life in urban areas, not so much in rural areas. So this is actually, um, a very early, like late 18th, early 19th century illustration. It's called Indigestion. And so there's this poor guy sitting by the fire in his bedroom and there's a plum pudding there. And, you know, there's a little fat guy with a big plate of something and he's just being tormented by these demons of indigestion. He ate too much, ate the wrong thing. He's having his bedtime snack. It's another thing progressives were against was snacking between meals. That totally comes out of the progressive era. Um, so he's being punished with, with indigestion. This is an example of an early 20th century soda fountain um, inside a pharmacy. You can see there's a very flamboyant uh, soda jerk there doing something complicated with the glass. There's all these beautiful silver cups and glasses stacked in pyramids. Um, there's all sorts of different syrups and mixes and soda waters that you can put together. Um, and you see all the stools lined up in front because for one of the first times ever outside of taverns and saloons, you could eat right at the bar. We get the development of the lunch counter comes out of soda fountain culture. And then although breakfast cereal is super popular, we do still have hot cereals. I just love this, this illustration, this advertisement. It's from the 1920s, 19 teens, 1920s. So we have this little kid in his very 19 teens, 1920s looking football uniform. And it's for National Oats and says, makes kids husky, which takes on a different, <laughs> a different meaning later in the century. But I just thought this is a great advertisement of breakfast cereal, right, giving kids energy and strength, that's a theme that continues for the next 150 years, just about. All right, so in the interwar period, so between World War I and World War II, um, we have some interesting things happening. A lot of the stuff that starts in the progressive era, um, particularly with white collar jobs, means our meals really start to change. We're eating more and more outside of the home and we're eating stuff that today we would not really consider a meal, right? So what's breakfast? If you can't have breakfast before you leave the house, you might have cereal. Lunch might be a slice of pie and a cup of coffee. That's your lunch. Or it might be donuts or a pretzel, you know, not really necessarily what we would consider a balanced meal today. And that continues through into the 20s and 30s and early 40s. Um, Again, we get the rise of the lunch box, people working in, in more industrial settings or 
um, places where you're gonna, you're not going to be anywhere near restaurants. Again, we start with the lunch pail, which is an agrarian and early school lunch thing, right? You, particularly in rural areas, you would have a little pail with your lunch. It's probably sandwiches or, you know, cold meat and and fruit or a piece of cake. You know, that was your bread and butter. That was like prevalent in a lot of um, lunch boxes in rural areas that starts to transition also into urban areas, people bringing their lunch with them. You get the rise of the 24 hour diner. Um, this one from the 1930s, I don't think is 24 hours, uh, but particularly as the trucking industry starts to get underway in the 20s and 30s, um, you get the development of a lot of these diners. A lot of them are open late night, um, particularly for uh, entertainers in large cities, you know, they're getting done at like 10, 11 o'clock midnight and they need to eat. Uh, so you get diners for that reason. You also get diners where people are traveling and they just need a quick bite. And I chose this image because um, it's very interesting. It's obviously post prohibition because it says beer served in frosted mugs. And then it's got breakfast, sandwiches, lunch, there's a 25 cent platter, which is probably something like blue plate special. They have hot dogs, they have hamburgers, right? So even today, what we very stereotypically think of as diner food. And then diners also start to kind of absorb soda fountains in terms of the types of food that they sell, right? We start to get ice cream sodas and milkshakes and, and things like that. The other big change to American eating habits obviously is the Great Depression. Uh, and with that comes the CCC and the WPA. So for a lot of Americans who are enrolled in um, these labor programs, particularly the labor camps with the CCC and the WPA where they're building stuff, uh, a lot of these guys are eating the best meals of their lives while they're here, right? So if you grew up on a not very good farm or kind of a small farm, or if you grew up as a sharecropper, right, you did not necessarily have access to a lot of high quality, nutritious food, particularly during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, and all of a sudden you're on the CCC, you're doing incredibly hard manual labor for about six hours a day, but you're getting a giant breakfast, giant lunch, giant supper, like all the milk you can drink, all the food you can eat. Um, and so a lot of these people this is the first time they've really eaten like this. And it starts to have an influence throughout the country on the style of food that people are eating. This is another image from the 1940s. These are all truck drivers uh, at a diner having coffee and soup and, and whatever else. But most of them, it looks like the guy might in the middle here might have a piece of pie right there. Um, but again, they're, the primary clientele is truck drivers. And then this is also interesting. In the 1930s and definitely into World War II, a lot of nutrition research is still happening. Most of the vitamins that we know about today were discovered between 1915 and 1946, 48. Um, so with these discoveries in vitamins, there starts to be a lot more emphasis on nutrition rather than quantity of food or quality of food. The emphasis starts to be on the actual nutrition. So this is um, from the US Public Health Service. This is about giving people that work, <laughs> particularly in manual labor, you know, foods that count, giving them a lunch that is going to get them through the day. Um, so he's got milk here. He's got steak and potato. He's got a raw salad, right? You get vitamins from raw salad. He's got carrots, that's a vitamin. It's like all of the vitamin food groups are represented here. Um, and that emphasis on a balanced meal really starts in the 1930s and especially as we get into World War II in the 1940s. Uh, we also start to get the development of school lunch, right? So I talked a little bit about the school lunch pail and the school lunch box. Um, and I found this great poster from the 1930s WPA and it talks about a, what constitutes a good lunch. And it's very interesting. If you look at historic cookbooks and recipes and stuff, the quantity of food that they're recommending people consume, particularly children, is quite high. I'm always kind of surprised. So they're talking about 
you want a combination of a hot food and a sandwich and fruit. Again, this is a little bit more geared toward vitamins and also roughage and milk. Milk becomes, milk is kind of established at the turn of the 20th century um, as like a super important food for children nutritionally. That um, conventional wisdom continues up until the present day, really, people are just starting to push back against it a little bit. Um, but milk kind of constitutes the backbone of, of calories and nutrition. And then this is from, um, this is post more, it says every child needs a good school lunch. It's the school lunch program where you can get government funding to offset some of your costs for having a hot lunch at school for all the children, right? And that's a program that starts during and especially after World War II in large part because um, a nutrition study that came out in 1941 as part of the draft, registering men for the draft, um, you know, you had to get a physical. And the report at the time stated that 40% of Americans young, America's young men were, were malnourished. And it wasn't actually that many people. Uh, historians have gone back and looked at the statistics and they're like, man, it wasn't that many. But it had a huge impact on um, government policy and the school lunch program is one of the things that comes out of that as an effort to ensure that in the future children are not malnourished um, like they were following the uh, or during the Great Depression. All right, post war, uh, we have a little bit of a change in our eating habits. There's this interesting tension in the 1950s, particularly in 1950s and 60s um, media depictions of family life between the full hot breakfast that you know the merry little housewife is making you bacon and eggs and pancakes and sausage and waffles like every morning for breakfast versus what was probably the reality which is a lot of kids were just eating sugary breakfast cereals like post sugar crisp right which is so sugary it says literally that you can eat it like candy which is probably basically what it was um, you also have the rise of dinner parties. So this is something that had kind of been on hiatus in the 1930s and 40s and comes back with a vengeance in the 1950s. We do still have restaurant eating, um, but it's not considered as, what's the word, not, I don't want to say like fashionable, but it's, it's considered better to, have, to host a dinner party rather than for everybody to go out to a restaurant, right? Restaurants are more like special occasion things. So by hosting a dinner party, you could kind of show off your skills. Um, and again, by this point, I kind of forgot to talk about this, you guys, sorry. By this point, the hot meal of the day has shifted to the end of the day. And that is um, in large part a reaction to shifting, people shifting work lives, right? So more and more people are working outside of the home. Um, and that means that it's harder and harder to come back in the middle of the day for a noon meal. There's also health reasons for not consuming a giant meal in the middle of the day, health reasons at the time. Um, and also there's fashion reasons. It was considered unfashionable to, and kind of like rural, right, to have your big hot meal in the middle of the day because that's what people in rural areas did. So fa fashionable urban people are being snobbish about it. They're like, no, no, we should eat later in the evening. It's more, you know, haute cuisine. I don't know what, but yeah. So by the time we get to the post-World War II, we are firmly entrenched in having our big hot meal of the day be after five o'clock. There is this weird transition time where people are complaining about like, you don't know when people are going to be sitting down to their big hot meal of the day. So you can't just like go over to their house because they might be having it at noon. They might be having it at one or two, could be three or four, could be six or seven. You know, there's no real set time in kind of this transition period. But by the time we get to the 1950s, it's pretty much like dinner's on the table once father gets home from work, that kind of thing. We also get the rise of barbecue. So we had some outdoor eating that's happening at the turn of the 20th century, people picnicking and things like that. But really in the 50s and 60s, barbecuing and eating out of doors comes back with a vengeance. And ironically, not necessarily in the evening. So, you know, on the weekends, your big meal of the day might be in the middle of the day because you're having people over for a barbecue. Or, you know, your Sunday dinner might be at two o'clock, but then during the week, you're eating the big meal of the day later in the day. So it's interesting how these little things hold on over time. 
again, school lunch is pretty firmly entrenched by the 1950s as a hot lunch provided by the school. You get the rise of convenience foods. So it makes it quicker and easier to make um, various meals. You know, we used to have breakfast cereal with a vengeance. Um, you start to get, uh, you know, we have sliced bread that makes sandwich making a lot easier. You start to get packaged um, deli meats, you know, things like Oscar Mayer bologna, stuff like that. Um, Campbell's soup. So you could have hot soup for lunch if your kid comes home for lunch or if, you know, they're home on the weekends or whatever. And then we also get more and more interest in fast food and road food. So we had the development of the diner in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Um, also starting in the 30s and 40s, we get the development of some fast food chains and franchises. And so by the time we get to the 1950s, um, places like White Castle, McDonald's, KFC, you know, those sorts of places are starting to get a little bit of a hold on American society. Although we do still also have a lot of more locally owned and operated places. But people are traveling more um, and we're driving a lot more. We get the start of the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System and people are, you know, taking family road trips to national parks in the summer or to Disneyland, right? And so when you're traveling with your family, you're in your own vehicle. Um, some people did bring food with them, particularly Black Americans who um, were not as welcome in a lot of towns, sundown towns. You had the green book to tell you where it was safe to go. People brought food with them. But if you're a white American, you wanted to stop and eat at a restaurant and you wanted to know that it was gonna be reasonably priced and reasonably close to maybe something you had in the last town over the day before, right? So um, you start to get the rise of these chain restaurants that get more and more popular in the decades after the Second World War. Great image of a dinner party. This actually, I think it's a cocktail party. It's hard to tell, but she's got this little cart with the coffee carafe with the little sterno can underneath it. And there's a cake on the bottom and then there's sandwiches on the top. And I don't know what they're, if they're just smoking or if they're actually drinking something, but anyway, rise the dinner party. This is obviously in somebody's home, right? Not a restaurant. An example of both commercial goods, uh, brand names and barbecue, right? We have this strange confluence of Dole brand pineapple and Polynesian everything, which was popular in the 50s and 60s and barbecue, which was also super popular in the 50s and 60s. So we got all kinds of stuff going on. We got pineapple and burgers. We got pineapple and hot dog kebabs. We got some kind of pineapple drink that might be ice cream with pineapple sauce all the ways you can use dull pineapple. This is another example of road food influencing how and when we eat. And I said earlier that Americans, like the defining quality of American meals in the 19th and 20th century is Americans eating on the run, right? And, and Howard Johnson's becomes one of the examples of that. It actually starts as a fried clam shack. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of ends up as a hotel rest area, right? And then expands across the country, um, famous for its fried clams and other food uh, and becomes popular among families traveling throughout the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Um, and then of course they also have ice cream too. This is a menu from the 1970s, I believe in McDonald's. Um, I chose this one because as our car culture expands as we start to get working mothers, right? In the 1960s and especially the 70s and 80s, we start to have some recessions. We have women's liberation. We have more women entering the workforce out of necessity and desire. So we have two income households and that means you have to have convenient meals, right? And McDonald's and other fast food places are one of the things that provide us convenient meals. And I like this one just because it's a very simple kind of quintessential McDonald's menu before it gets all crazy like it does in the 90s and 2000s. All right, now we're in the late 20th century. I know it seems weird to be talking about it that way, but it is the last couple of decades of the 20th century. Uh, in the 1970s, we have a little bit of a health food rev revolution, right? Coming out of 
um, a response to the excesses of the 1950s, just kind of like we did with the progressive era and the Gilded Age. We're having another one in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so you get, you know, more prominent use of things like yogurt and granola and lentils and tofu. You get kind of an expansion into cuisines that are not meat and potatoes and a vegetable. Um, and with that health food revolution comes an, a little bit of an agrarian revolution. We have this kind of back to the land movement, um, which again is kind of this undercurrent that keeps happening through the 1970s and 80s and 90s, but it's kind of overshadowed by the rise of malls, right? So I have this image, this is from the 1980s. We have pretzel wagon, right? We get the rise of food courts and malls. Fast food becomes hugely popular. People are eating on the move all the time at this point in American history. And because of that, <laughs> there is renewed emphasis on the importance of the sit-down family dinner. Um, growing up in the 90s, as I did, I remember a lot of media talking about how important it was for the entire family to sit down at a dinner together. So this is the time of like latchkey kids and people are in a million sports and extracurricular activities. Mom and dad are maybe working late. You know, if both parents are working, it's hard to get a meal on the table. So the emphasis was not so much on the type of food that was being consumed, but the action of everyone sitting together and eating as a family unit because there were worries about the destruction of the family unit, right? Because everybody was doing their own thing and not necessarily spending time together. We also get the rise of microwaves, which everybody likes to make fun of now, but were actually hugely important um, cooking innovation that kind of has a lot of class stuff tied to it now. Um, but those started to become affordable in the 1970s. And by the time we get to the 1980s and 1990s, pretty much every household has one, right? So this is Alice Waters on opening day of Chez Panisse in 1971, hugely influential on the types of foods that Americans go on to eat, at least relatively wealthy, food conscious Americans, right? This is kind of representative of the whole um, sustainable agriculture, back to the land, like a real food movement that um, she is a part of. There's this very quintessential late 80s, early 90s mall food court. Right, so here we have families sitting down and eating a meal together, but it's fast food in a mall, right? I think the mall is kind of the defining um, quality of the United States in the 1980s and 90s, right? They're kind of on the wane now, but. And then we have a, one an early news or early magazine advertisement for um, for a microwave, a microwave oven, and that helps revolutionize our eating in a lot of ways. Um, primarily because it makes convenience foods so much easier. Things like TV dinners that previously had to be baked, you can now microwave them. Microwave popcorn becomes super popular. But the main thing that I think microwaves change in our eating habits is the rise of the snack, particularly the after school snack for kids, right? So we get things like Hot Pockets and Totino's Pizza Rolls and Easy Mac. And it's things that kids can make themselves because the microwave oven was self-contained and considered safer than cooking things on the stove or in a range oven, right? And now we're in the early 21st century. We've been in the 21st century for 20 years already, you guys. It's kind of crazy. So we have some changes to our eating habits in the 21st century. We have the return of savory breakfast. So I think for a lot of people throughout the 1980s and 1990s, breakfast is like, you know, IHOP <laughs> breakfast cereals. I think we still have diner breakfast, you know, like bacon and eggs kind of thing, but home breakfasts are largely sweet. Um, you get the rise of breakfast for supper, which is a funny throwback to the 19th century style of eating. People are coming home late from work. They're tired. They don't want to cook, you know, roasted chicken and make mashed potatoes and green beans. We're going to have pancakes instead, <laughs> you know, or we're going to have egg, scrambled eggs and toast for supper, 
right? It's I think people's level of exhaustion depends a little bit on on what they're going to make for supper. We get the rise of interest in superfoods, right? And kind of um, moving away from the meat and three that has kind of dominated most of American history and more towards um, bowls, right? 21st century really like bowls, Buddha bowls, acai bowls, salads, you know, different um, international cuisines like Asian food or Indian food or some Mexican food where things are kind of all combined together. It's not separate. Um, and then snacking continues. Uh, I know myself, I've had a snack supper before where it's just <laughs> a variety of nibbles rather than what would be considered a hot complete meal. And that is part of this ongoing deconstruction of meals. So I have this nice image here of meal planning, right, which is another 21st century trend in order to not have cereal for dinner. <laughs> a lot of people are using their weekends to pre-plan, pre-cook, and pre-portion all of their meals for the week. That is a new trend. Um, this is kanji, which is the traditional Chinese um, chicken based uh, rice porridge, which has gotten very popular in some areas in the United States. It's a savory breakfast. People who are like allowed to have savory breakfast are really excited about kanji. We have the ubiquitous acai bowl, which again is about superfoods, right? So acai is very popular as a very antioxidant rich fruit. We have fruits and nuts. It looks like there might be some chia seed in there, right? It's very health conscious, basically a smoothie in a bowl. <laughs> um, and this is breakfast for a lot of people or lunch sometimes. So very deconstructed to compare it to previous generations meals. There are some people who even go a step further and they just eat granola bars, power bars, protein bars, meal replacement bars. That's what they're eating. So what's the future of meals? I had to put this funny little meme on here. I'm not an iced coffee drinker, but I know it's become a thing in our modern culture. And the sign says, this is from Arthur, by the way, the kids, PBS Kids cartoon, Arthur. It says, iced coffee is not a meal replacement on the sign. And she's saying, uh, this sign won't stop me because I can't read. <laughs> so obviously, People are just drinking iced coffee instead of eating real food, right? So what's the future of our meals? Are we gonna go the route of meal replacement bars and pills and shakes that just taste like chocolate, but it's like pea protein? Are we gonna go the direction of everything is farm fresh and we're making foods from scratch? Because that is definitely a trend that's happening in the 20th century, 21st century, especially since the pandemic, people are a lot more focused on controlling the type of food that they eat, right? Professional chefs for everyone. Are we just all gonna eat in restaurants all the time? I don't know. You tell me. All right, that's the end of my talk. I see we have a couple questions here in the chat. Okay, E says, what's the difference between dinner and supper? Only older people seem to use the term supper. So that is definitely a generational thing. And that comes from when dinner was the noon meal. And so supper was your e less complicated evening meal. Um, it seems to be kind of regional. It seems to be um, sort of arbitrary. I guess it just depends on, on what your family says. I tend to do either. I kind of use them interchangeably and I think a lot of people do. Um, but historically, dinner was the noon meal, or it was the noon meal, the giant hot meal of the day was at noon and later shifts until later of the day. So I think that's why the term dinner persists is because people are thinking about it as the big hot meal of the day and supper is maybe a lighter meal. So maybe that's why older people use it. I don't know. Anyway, any other questions? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts about this new trend, uh, intermittent fasting? Oh yeah. So that's, I didn't get into this, but there's, um, 
in a different room. There's a great book called, um, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can look it up. <laughs> it's called uh, Three Squares, I think. Let me just Google it quick. Yeah, it's called Three, Qu Three Squares, The Invention of the American Meal. Um, and the author, Abigail Carroll, in the beginning, when she's talking about early America, she talks about how indigenous people ate and how Europeans were very disdainful of that because indigenous people ate when they were hungry. And they, you know, there was maybe like a communal pot that you would go eat out of when you were hungry, or you might have like pemmican or jerky or something that you're just kind of eating on the fly. Um, and a lot of like the feasting was around uh, harvest times. And she said something very interesting, which I hadn't really considered was that in a lot of indigenous cultures, the kind of, you know, self-control of eating was to train your body for fast times. So like in late spring, when there's no food in the wild and you maybe have eaten up your store of food for the winter, you just don't eat until food is available. So there was a lot of emphasis on, on training the body for that. But then there was also great times of feasting, right? When food was widely available in at harvest time or in the fall when you're when you're hunting a lot to build up your stores for the winter. Um, so it's a much different style of eating. And but in medieval Europe, there also was quite a lot of fasting because of Catholic feast days and fast days. So for instance, around Christmas time, you know, the 12 days of Christmas, which is 12 days of eating, but the whole month before that, you're basically fasting and not not fasting in terms of not eating, but fasting in terms of you're just eating like bread and beans <laughs> and vegetables, you know, no meat, no fat, no sugar, because you have to save up your rations of all of that to make all of these rich dishes for Christmas. But it was also, I think, part of, you know, you're, you're doing all this extra work so you can rest for the 12 days of Christmas and you're fasting so that it makes the feasting seem more meaningful, which I think we're kind of lost in our modern culture. It's just like all excess all the time in some ways. Um, but yeah, intermittent fasting, I think, is trying to kind of recreate those more historical, um, like way back historical patterns of consumption that don't necessarily match today because our, our activity levels don't match today. And also our calorie burning doesn't match historically. So in the night, like 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, everybody was doing extreme manual labor pretty much all the time. <laughs> Even, you know, the retiring woman, you know, unless you were a wealthy Southern belle and you had enslaved a bunch of people to do all the work for you, you had to do a lot of that work yourself. There was no central heating. So you're burning a lot more calories to keep warm. And actually um, people like uh, culinary historian, Ruth Goodman, have who have you know done a lot of living history talk about when you're cold all the time you really crave a lot of fat and so that's why there was some emphasis on lard and pie and meat with rich gravies and i think stuff like that whereas we have central heat and central air right so we don't eat less in the summer because it's too hot because we all have air conditioning so there's these kind of seasonal patterns of eating that are not a part of our modern lives so I think that's why some of that fasting stuff, people are trying to adopt that because that's what our bodies were more built for. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any suggestions for my talk? Because I did it for the first time. Anything you think I missed? I feel like I missed a lot probably, but. The, the talk was so good and fun to listen to. I oh, really liked you. it. Thank I really you. did. And, and are you going to make some more talks like this coming up soon at, at this place, at this library or any other? Um, Kat, I don't think we have any. Do we have one for the fall, Catherine? I don't remember. Yeah, but we I... should look to the fall. Nothing for the summer. Yeah. We definitely look for, and probably not so much September because things are slow for us in September, but maybe in October. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, Susan, I definitely have a lot of other talks and some of them have 
some of my other talks have been recorded um, by the Rye Free Reading Room and also by some other libraries. You can find them on YouTube. If you want to just, you know, listen to me talk, you can do that. <laughs> It'll be a recording, but it's pretty close to the same. Very good. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so E is asking again the difference between supper and dinner. So there really isn't a difference anymore. Um, but historically, dinner was the big hot meal of the day, usually at noon, and supper was a lighter meal, usually in the evening. Um, but that has shifted enough to where there's now no discernible difference between the two. Um, many times there used to be a midnight supper. If people were a little more wealthy and they went to the theater or um, dancing, they would they would have a midnight supper and they would say, shall we sup? You know, and then and they would have maybe some wine and uh, and maybe some cold meat and some bread and cheese, that sort of thing. Yeah, so Susan, you might have missed that. I did talk a little bit about that, like in the first couple of slides. Um, but yeah, very popular foods for midnight suppers were chafing dish foods, which are really popular in the 1890s. And then they get kind of a revival in the 1920s to so things like Welsh Welsh rarebit or like shrimp wiggle, basically any kind of creamy thing you can serve on toast. Um, you know, fried oysters, things like that, which aren't really a full meal, but yeah, you want kind of some kind of snack after you, you go out in the evening. Oh, interesting. Kim says, my family comes from a Virginia mill town and for my relatives, it's still breakfast, dinner, supper. Yeah, and that the term dinner for the noon meal persists in a lot of rural areas throughout the country. It doesn't seem to be that regional. It seems to be more of a rural urban divide. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> well, if you're like me and you always think of something after the presentation is over, you can always track me down on my website, thefoodhistorian.com, or I'm on Facebook and Instagram and and all those fun places. I'm even on TikTok now, although I don't post that much. So <laughs> impressive. <laughs> all right. Well, once again, you were one. Oh, the, we have a question about lunch. <sighs> yeah, E. That's it's. No one is. Oh, not really quite sure. Where it comes from the medieval term nunchen right, which is kind of like a snacky meal. Um, it's probably a corruption of the term luncheon, which again, doesn't necessarily mean a meal in the middle of the day. It means more of like a light meal, usually served cold. Um, but yeah, by the time we get to the 20th century, it's pretty firmly entrenched as a, as a term that means a cold a cold meal usually served in the middle of the day, right? Okay. okay, I think that's it. Thank you so, so much. And we'll talk about the fall. <laughs> I'll be in touch the next couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you. Just uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Have Thanks a good for being my guinea pigs. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.